And chapter 47 is about animal development. So um, development occurs um, all throughout an animal's life cycle. Um, if it goes through metamorphosis, it takes place there. It happens with gametes being produced as well as um, to a great extent during embryonic development. There are lots of different body plans, but they, um, regardless of the animal, um, they share a lot of developmental mechanisms. They use um, a similar set of regulatory genes. Um, and the embryonic development stages follow a pre pretty set order, fertilization, cleavage, gastrulation, and organogenesis. Um, as the embryo continues to develop, um, we talked about differentiation and determination earlier this year. Those are going to start to play a role. Specific patterns of gene expression will um, direct cells to um, adopt certain fates. Um, and then we can use model organisms as a result in a laboratory setting to be able to study development since there are a lot of similarities across animals. So those are just showing you the stages of embryonic development and then in the frog, how it goes through metamorphosis to form an adult frog. So we're gonna um, take a step back and look at spermatogenesis and oogenesis. Spermatogenesis is um, the production of mature sperm cells in males. Um, there are approximately 250 to 400 million sperm cells made daily, pretty wild, but only half of those actually become viable sperm. Um, Sertoli cells um, help to support sperm cells through the spermatogenesis process by um, helping to maintain the environmental conditions the sperm need and secreting substances that are needed for their development. Um, this process is very sensitive to environmental fluctuations, such as hormones and temperature. We need lots of testosterone to be around to be able to maintain this process. Um, some of the stem cells that are present that are diploid spermatogonial stem cells do not go through meiosis. They just go through mitosis so that there are plenty of sperm cells available um, throughout um, the male's life. Um, when they go through mitosis, they produce two diploid primary spermatocytes. Those diploid primary spermatocytes are the ones that go through meiosis one, and this is part of why not every sperm cell becomes a sperm. Um, and when they go through meiosis one, they make the two haploid secondary spermatocytes. Um, the secondary spermatocytes are able to go through meiosis two and produce four haploid early spermatids. So these are not the sperm that are full-fledged mature. They have, those spermatids have to go through spermiogenesis. Um, they have to um, form their acrosome, um, which is the thick head that contains enzymes that allow it to penetrate the egg. Um, they have to get their DNA condensed, and then they have to form the tail so they will be able to move their flagella. So again, not every spermatogonial stem cell will end up becoming a sperm um, because some of those are just going to go through mitosis and keep going through mitosis so that there's plenty of them available. Eugenesis is a little bit different, although it does produce um, the germ cell for females. Um, the diploid primary oocytes are um, first made um, through diploid oogonia going through mitosis, either before the female is born or shortly after. So there is a finite number of diploid primary oocytes present. Um, the primary oocytes re replicate their DNA and start in meiosis one, and then they stop um, at prophase one until hormones cause them to be activated. Um, and that's when they will go through their ovarian cycle. FSH will stimulate a follicle to enlarge and then complete meiosis one, um, which will result in a haploid secondary oocyte and your first polar body. Um, when that secondary oocyte is getting prepared to enter meiosis two, it'll be arrested in metaphase two. And at that point, a luteinizing hormone will trigger ovulation and that secondary oocyte, an ovum, will be released. If the ovum is fertilized, meiosis II is completed, your second polar body gets formed. If not, it disintegrates. There's no second polar body and the menstrual cycle takes place. Okay. 
So just some differences between spermatogenesis and oogenesis. Fertilization is when you form a diploid zygote from a haploid egg and sperm. There are specific events that have to take place, certain molecules that have to be present at the egg surface to enable fertilization to occur successfully. Um, generally speaking, sperm penetrate the protective layer around your egg. Egg surface receptors bind to molecules um, that are present on the sperm surface. And then the egg surface will undergo changes, prevent polyspermy, aka multiple sperm nuclei entering the egg. Um, so one reaction we're going to talk about is the acrosomal reaction. And this take is triggered when the sperm actually meets the egg. Um, at the tip of the sperm is an acrosome. It's a specialized vesicle that has hydrolytic enzymes. And when it leaves the sperm by exocytosis, it starts to digest the jelly coat, which is serving as protective layer around the egg. Um, once it does this, the acrosomal process develops growing actin filaments um, that protrude from the sperm's head and then are able to penetrate the egg's jelly coat. Um, these protein molecules, or sorry, the protein molecules that are on the tip of that acrosomal process are the ones that bind to the egg's membranes receptors. And that allows the membranes of the sperm and egg to fuse together. At that point, the sperm nuclei can enter the egg cytoplasm and ion channels open up. Um, that allows sodium to come in and depolarize the membrane. Um, and when that depolarization process takes place, that prevents additional sperm from entering. Um, or from fusing with the egg's plasma membrane, and we call that a fast block to polyspermy. This takes place very, very quickly, one to three seconds. The cortical reaction also is initiated when the egg and sperm fuse together. Right after the sperm binds to the egg, there are some cortical granules, and I'll show you a picture of this, vesicles in the cytoplasm that are just beneath the egg's plasma membrane, and they start to fuse with that plasma membrane. The contents get released, the enzymes and macromolecules, between the plasma membrane and the surrounding vitaline layer, which is the um, made by the cell's extracellular matrix. Um, it lifts this away from the egg and allows it to harden into what we know now as the fertilization envelope. Um, you need a lot of calcium ions to make this possible. And studies have shown that as calcium spread ac spreads across the egg, the fertilization envelope also begins to appear. Um, so getting that calcium there is really critical. Um, the contents of those cortical or the cortical granules also contain um, molecules that cause the sperm binding receptors to be removed from the egg cell membrane. Um, that fertilization envelope we talked about and then losing the receptors um, also prevent additional sperm nuclei from entering. And so this is what's known as the slow block to polyospermy because it's a little bit more lasting. Okay, so there you can see the receptors, the jelly coat, the acrosome making up part of the sperm. Notice that there's a centriole um, present in the sperm that might play a role later on when we talk about the cell going through divisions. The actin filaments that are starting to um, form um, as the enzymes start to chew away at that jelly coat. Um, you've got your vitaline layer, which is again formed from that cytoskeleton um, that separates the cell membrane from the jelly coat. Um, as the enzymes start to chew away at that jelly coat and the um, actin filament is able to extend into the um, cell cytoplasm, the egg cell cytoplasm, we see that um, it's releasing proteins which bind to those receptors, or sorry, the acrosomal process, and that allows the membranes to fuse together. And once those are fused together, that sets off your cortical granules, um, which starts to open up that space between the vitaline layer and the cell membrane. So that's going to serve as your fertilization envelope and it gets rid of the sperm binding receptors so that no more sperm can enter the cell. Fertilization um, sets off some metabolic reactions which help to get the embryo to go through its divisions. 
the increase in calcium concentrations that we are that are needed for the cortisol reaction to occur also increase the rates of respiration, so getting you energy, and protein synthesis, translation. Um, all the mRNAs that are needed are already present, so you don't have to worry about transcription, and you already have your proteins. Um, so as once that sperm nucleus is able to merge with the egg nucleus, cell division can take place. Um, specifically in mammals, um, al along with other terrestrial animals, this fertilization is internal. Um, capacitation is, um, takes, is when secretions that are present in the female re reproductive tract alter sperm motility um, and structure. They've got to take place um, before the sperm can fertilize an egg. So we have to have some more modifications made to the sperm before fertilization can occur. There are support cells um, that surround that jelly later, corona radi radiata. Um, they remain with it before and during ovulation. Um, sperm have to get through those before reaching the zona pellucidia, which is the um, jelly coat that surrounds the egg. We talked about how sperm bind to um, um, sperm binding will help to set off um, the ability for the nuclei to enter. Um, the sperm have to actually bind as well to the zona pellucidia receptors, which is going to get that acrosomal reaction started. In mammals, there is no fast-blocked polyspermy. Um, again, the protein on the sperm bind to egg plasma membrane. This part's going to sound familiar. This is just like what we saw in general. Um, they bind. They cause changes to occur, leading to the cortical reaction, which also changed the zona pellucidia. Um, again, your slow block. Um, once the sperm is able to enter and the envelopes of both the egg and the sperm have dispersed, the chromosomes for the two are organized on one mitotic spindle. Remember we talked about how there were microtubules present, centrioles in the sperm. And that first spell division occurs about 12 to 36 hours after the sperm is bound. Um, and that's when you finally have your true diploid nucleus um, it'll be surrounded by a nuclear membrane, and that is when fertilization is completed. Um, once we've gone through fertilization, we have a, pro, um, a series of cleavage steps um, where we have both synthesis and mitosis take place, but we do not have the growth part, um, G1 or G2, take place in the cell cycle. Um, cleavage basically takes the cytoplasm of your um, former egg cell and divides it into smaller cells called blastomeres. Um, the blastula is a ball of cells that has a fluid-filled cavity called a blastocele. Um, and when cleavage is complete, you have quite a lot of nuclear material compared to your cytoplasmic material. That ratio is very large. Okay. Um, cleavage patterns. Frogs and other animals, yolk, which is present in these egg cells, stored nutrients, plays a pretty significant role in determining how cleavage is going to occur. The vegetal pole has more yolk. The animal pole has yes, less yolk. Um, we can tell the two poles. The animal, because it doesn't have the yolk in it, will be gray due to melanin, while the vegetal will be yellow. Um, and then there's a gray crescent, which basically helps to distinguish between the two poles. So when we have cleavage take place in the frog, it will result in four equally sized blastomeres, but the third cleavage will be asymmetric, so things won't be divided as evenly. Um, you can have cleavage occur in one of two ways, holoblastic or meroblastic. Holoblastic is when the egg is completely divided, um, and that would be when you don't have a whole lot of yolk or you have moderate amounts of yolk present. Meroblastic is when there are when you have a yolk rich egg. So dividing the egg completely is not possible. Um, we see that more with reptiles and birds. Sea urchins and frogs are the ones that are going to use more holoblastic cleavage. Okay. Um, and that eight cell stage that you see over there on the left, um, that is a morula. Okay. The blastula we see it's got 128, and then 
In this next section, we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about gastrulation and how morphogenesis um, will help to play a, as opposed to, sorry, morphogenesis will play a significant role in where cells are going to go, what their shape is going to be, and whether they're going to um, survive or not, or whether they're going to go through apoptosis. Once cleavage has taken place, cell division rates slow down and we continue, we go back to um, our normal cell cycle. So morphogenesis is getting cells to their appropriate locations. Gastralization or gastrulation is gonna play a pretty critical role in that, moving cells from the blastula surface to the embryo's interior, as well as organogenesis forming organs. Gastrulation is taking your blastula cells and rearranging them into a three-layered embryo called a gastrula. And there are three layers produced from this process. There are the embryonic germ layers, your ectoderm, your endoderm, and your mesoderm. The ectoderm makes the outer layer. The endoderm is going to line your digestive tract, and the mesoderm is going to take up the space between the two. Each of those specific germ layers will play a role in the development of specific structures. Um, so the ectoderm is going to help to develop your epidermis, your nervous and sensory systems, your pituitary gland, your adrenal medulla, the jaws and teeth, and your germ cells. The mesoderm, that middle layer, is going to be responsible for your skeletal and muscular system, circulatory lymphatic, excretory reproductive, but not the germ cells, um, your skin dermis, so the layer underneath your epidermis, and your adrenal cortex. The endoderm is going to help to make the epithelial lining of your digestive tract and the organs associated with it, such as your liver and pancreas, the lining of your respiratory, excretory, and reproductive um, tracts and ducts, and then your thymus, your thyroid, and your parathyroid glands. In humans, he, um, the eggs have very little yolk. So a blastocyst is basically our equivalent of the blastula. The inner cell mass is a cluster of cells found at one end of the blastocyst. The trophoblast, the outer epithelial layer of that blastocyst, is not going to be a part of the development of the embryo, but it's going to um, play a key role in implanting the embryo. Um, and it will continue to expand once it has been implanted. That's going to help to perform the placenta. And there are extra embryonic membranes that enclose specialized structures that are outside of the embryo itself. Um, gastralization is going to involve inward movement of the epiblast um, through a primitive streak, which is similar to what we see in the chick embryo. So there's your blastocyst. You can see that inner cell mass and the trophoblast and your blastocele. Um, the blastocyst is implanting. There's an expanding trophoblast region helping to form your placenta. Um, and you've now got your epiblast and your hypoblast and your trophoblast. As the trophoblast starts to expand more, we start to see extra embryonic membranes form. Um, we've got an amniotic cavity. We've got the yolk sac from the hypoblast, um, the extra embryonic mesoderm cells from the epiblast, and the chorion from the trophoblast. And then once we have gotten through gastrulation, we've got the three-layered embryo um, with those four extra embryonic membranes, the amnion, the chorion, um, the allantois, and the yolk sac. So adaptations that amniotes have um, developed over time. For vertebrates to be able to colonize land, they had to find ways to be able to reproduce successfully. Um, the shelled egg was one of those, and the uterus was another. Um, regardless of those adaptations, they both um, result in the embryo being surrounded in a sac, which is known as the amnion, which prevents the embryo from desiccation and, again, allows that reproduction process to occur on land. And that is why mammals and reptiles, including birds, are called amniotes. I talked a little bit about these extra embryonic membranes in the previous slide, um, what the function is of each of those. The chorion is going to play a key role in gas exchange. The amnion is just, again, providing a protective layer for that amniotic fluid to prevent desiccation. The yolk sac is um, monitoring the nutrients that are needed for the embryo to develop. 
And the allantois is able to get rid of waste products and it also contributes somewhat to gas exchange. During organogenesis, um, various germ layers are able to start developing into rudimentary organs. In vertebrate organogenesis, the notochord forms from dorsal mesoderm, the neural plate from thickened ectoderm. That neural plate will curve inward, forming your neural tube, which will be the start of your central nervous system, your brain and your spinal cord. Um, in vertebrate embryos, there are some cells that develop near the neural tube and then migrate elsewhere, neural crust cells and somites. Um, the neural crust cells, again, are going to develop along those borders. They're going to pinch off and form things like nerves, teeth, skull bones. The somites are when you have group of cells that form blocks um, in the mesoderm that are lateral to the notochord. They help to organize segmented structure of the vertebrate body. Um, they also can dissociate into mesochyme cells, which form vertebrae and muscles. Um, and then lateral to the somites, the mesoderm will split to form the coelom, your body cavity. So there you can see the different layers, the neural plate being formed. There you see the neural plate folding to form the neural tube. And there you can see in the final one where the somites are being formed. Um, plants, but not animals, do not have their cells move um, because of the cell wall, but morphogenesis in animals does result in cell movement. Um, cytoskeleton reorganization is going to play a big role in changing your, shell sh your cell's shape throughout the developmental process. In neurulation, microtubules that are oriented from dorsal to ventral will help to lengthen cells um, along that sheet of ectodermal cells um, within that axis. Um, it'll help to, a cytoskeleton will help to promote the archenteron um, elongation, um, which is an example of convergent extension, making cells that are making up a tissue become narrower and longer. And the cytoskeleton plays a role in cells being migrated, and that's going to help to lead to organogenesis. So there you can see the convergence. Um, program cell death. I talked a little earlier about how some cells do not survive this process, apoptosis. Um, there are cells, depending on where you're at in development, or they could be individual, they could be tissues, they could be sets of cells that stop developing and are engulfed by neighboring cells. Um, neurons are one example of this. Lots of neurons are made. Not all of them will be needed. So the ones that don't make functional connections with other neurons that are not being used are removed. Um, some other examples are the cells that make up a tadpole's tail and webbing that is present um, initially between bird and mammal embryonic digits that eventually is eliminated. Termination differentiation. We talked a lot about this um, earlier on. Um, we were doing more cellular work. Um, determination is the process by which cells or a group of cells become committed to a particular fate. So at the beginning of the year, you um, decided to take AP bio. Um, differentiation would be going through it. Uh, differentiation is the resulting specialization of those cells once they have actually gone through that process. They may have been committed before, but they hadn't, you didn't see that physical change. Differentiation you do. Um, Cells in a multicellular organism will share the same genome. Um, the differences in cell types will be based on the genes that are being expressed. Fate maps show organs and other structures that arise from different regions of an embryo. Um, and that's how we've been able to see what the ectoderm and the endoderm and the mesoderm are able to make. And this is just showing how they were able to use um, studies of C. elegans where they um, were able to eliminate individual cells. They could determine what structure should arise from those cells. Um, pretty wild. Okay, so they're showing you um, after the first cell division, if you take out specific cells, what cells are responsible for what parts of the worm. Um, there are complexes in C. elegans called P. granules that are present throughout development and are um, able to be detected in their germ cells. 
and they are distributed again throughout that first fertilized egg and they move to the posterior end before it goes through cleavage and they continue to move um, towards the posterior most cells as it goes through additional cleavage. Those are acting as cytoplasmic determinants, helping to fix the germ cell fate fairly early on. So those bright areas are the P cells, or sorry, the P granules. Um, we spent a little bit of time talking about this with diversity. Bilateral symmetry body plan is found across um, animals, both dorsal ventral, anterior posterior. Um, the dorsal ventral, the right left axis, is largely symmetrical. Um, for frogs, we're able to determine the axis um, with eugenesis based on the poles. Um, the dorsal ventral isn't determined until fertilization. In chicks, gravity helps to determine anterior posterior and pH differences between the blastoderm sides help to determine dorsal ventral. In mammals, it's thought that the egg and sperm nuclei orientation before it undergoes fusion may help to develop those embryonic axes. So Speeman performed experiments to determine a cell's developmental potential, what possible structures it could give rise to. So when do these fates actually truly get set in place? Um, it, he determined that fates are affected by the distribution of the determinants and the cleavage pattern. Um, in a frog embryo, the first two blastomeres are totipotent, so they could still develop into all cell types. In mammals, this is the case up to the eight cell stage, and it's um, much longer than most other organisms. As cells continue to divide, there's pr progressive restriction, um, regardless of what animal you're looking at. Um, and Typically speaking, by the time you get to late grass, drilla stage, the tissue-specific fates of cells are, are set. Once they have acquired these fates, um, they can actually have an influence on um, cells that are um, close to each other by induction. Um, so Speeman and Mangold transplanted tissues between early gastrulas and determined that when you transplanted a dorsal lip, it would cause a second gastrulation to take place. Um, the dorsal lip was functioning as the embryo's body plan organizer. Um, so it kind of helped to cause um, a cascade of other changes occur. Um, inductive signal signals will play a major role in pattern formation, which is how things are spatially organized. Um, the molecular cues that control this are called positional information. So positional information influences pattern formation. Um, all of this tells a cell where it should be at in response to the body axes and how the cells and any copies of that cell respond to additional molecular signals. Um, and so there's an example with um, chicks. The wings and legs, like all vertebrate limbs, become as bumps of tissue, limb buds. The embryonic cells in those limb buds reson, respond to positional information, um, telling it basically um, where it needs to go along three axes, proximal, distal, anterior, posterior, and dorsal, ventral. Um, cilia are also going to play a role in this. Um, motile cilia play a role in left-right specification, and then non-motile cilia will play a role in kidney development. And that's showing you an example of things that are in reverse. 